Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Recovering Fundamentalist podcast. Guys, we have got an incredible, incredible lineup of stuff coming up here on the RFP that I'm excited to jump into. But how you doing this week? Nate, you look relaxed, man. You've been sitting on the beach all week. You feel good? Man, I am doing great. I'm a little bit, I've got a little jet lag or Jeep <laughs> lag, I guess, from driving all the way back from Florida late <laughs> last night. Yeah. And uh, man, we had a blast. I was there with my, I think it's the first time my whole family's been together on a vacation in uh, really a couple of years. I, we were awesome. talking about it. I can't even remember the last time, but I had my son and all my daughters there, my wife, my, my son's girlfriend was there. We had a blast. It was, awesome. it was amazing. Literally straight across the beach from uh street from the beach and man it was it was awesome and the had blue a blast angels. but i need to yeah the blue angels were there that's cool all that like two or three of the days that we were there they were doing practice runs it was amazing man the water was perfect it's hot in florida but we had that cool little uh i don't know if you've seen those little shade uh tents that you set up yeah. now it's a little stretchy kind you fill the yeah. little sandbags on the bottom it was, it was cool we got one of those and i've got my sand beach wagon thing that pulls out there on the set. It was awesome. Oh, you're we were, a professional. We were prepped, bro. Yeah. It, my wife is amazing. She's way ahead of way ahead of me on all that stuff. She ordered it all on Amazon. We had so much fun at the beach. And uh, of course, that I'm way salt behind now. I've got that salt life. That's it, man. <laughs> hey, <laughs> what is it about sitting on the beach that demands that you eat snacks? I don't know. I, I ate the whole time I was out there. See, that's uh, me too. Like when I sit on the beach, always under a shade because you guys know I turn a really rosy pink, but, uh, <laughs> while I'm sitting on the beach, for some reason, the sound of waves and snacking just seem to go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah, they definitely do. Well, while you've been sitting at the beach, I've been sitting at the house with a toothache. I was like, oh, Come on now. Oh. Nathan's on the beach and I'm sitting here. I swear mom did meth when she was pregnant with me. I'm, <laughs> I've got the absolute worst teeth in the world. She's going to listen to this and be like, John Calvin. Oh, I'm kidding, no. but, oh man. <laughs> have y'all ever had root canals? Brian, you ever had a root canal? I think I might have once. I think I've had one. The last like, one they tried to give me was on my very back tooth on the oh, top. Cool. And I was like, um, just is it, it possible just to pull this tooth yeah. out? What are the pros and cons? And he's just like, if you don't mind losing it, we can just pull it out. It's going to be a whole lot less painful and a lot That's less work did. and a lot less money. And so he pulled that bad boy, but yours is up front, man. So you, you can't think, just pull it. I'm pretty sure we are trying to think, I, I, I want to say I've had nine and this one's about to be the 10th root canal that I've had. Like people go get cavities filled. I get root canals. It's unbelievable, mm. but I'm 40 years old and I went to the dentist what a couple months ago and he said well there's a wisdom tooth so there it is guys i do have some wisdom i had no idea first time i've ever nice seen three years old and i got a wisdom <laughs> tooth up there nice no yeah take that whoever <laughs> <laughs> uh goodness you couldn't call your wife's name could you no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well guys we have got some incredible stuff coming up here in the life of the rfp something i'm super excited about uh, is actually happening right now. Uh, we had a lot of people buy the nine line apparel t-shirts. It's the let freedom ring and the RFP uh, partnership with nine line apparel.com. You can go there. It only lasts until July the 15th and it, it is a $25 shirt. I believe it is. Yep. $25 shirt and uh, proceeds go to help veterans. Um, and uh, man, get you a, a limited edition Nine Line Apparel and RFP T-shirt today by going to Nine Line Apparel. Did y'all order one? I've I've got mine on the way. I can't wait to get it here, bro. It's gonna be awesome. Man, that's a cool shirt. The eagle yeah. on the front of it, and the Let Freedom Ring, and then the RFP logo right in the center of the back of the shirt. Yeah. When you know when you when you go online and you see the front and the back and you look at it, guys, it's really cool to think that our logo is on the back of such a cool shirt. Yeah. attached to such a super cool company yeah yeah the thing i love about nine line apparel they get about a million hits a day on wow. their website uh, one of their lead designers is part of our church here and he said we get a million hits on our website and they shared the last episode and so tim lee's testimony is being shared with millions of veterans and uh, people who you know just need to hear an incredible message of the gospel and so be sure to get your limited edition t-shirt today by going to ninelineapparel.com 
And then, guys, January is coming super quick. Yeah. We are going to be heading to Israel. We still have a few spots available. This is for pastors, and it's 2800 bucks. You can go to recoveringfundamentalist.org. Go with us to Israel. Fellas, I, every day I wake up and I'm thinking about, I'm like, we're going to the Holy Land in just a few months. I'm so excited about this. It's going to be amazing, man. I'm looking forward to it. I heard from two or three people this week that uh, paid their deposit and they're excited yeah. about going. Everything's worked out. So we've got all the dates worked out, all the flights, everything's finalized. So come be a part of this. I know it still says on the website, uh, I think June was the, the, the deposit was due in June, but we are still accepting uh, new people to register for that. So please, if you're even interested in that, reach out to us, let's go. And if you get on there, click on the link, there is a password, it's RFP. Very yeah, simple. So right. just click on the link, enter the password RFP. It'll open the website to you and you can register. Go with us. That's it. Then what about the camp meeting coming up or the For the Sake of the Gospel conference, which are, guys, we're the first people to ever do a conference camp meeting. I know it. <laughs> That a is little true. bit of old, a little bit of the new. <laughs> oh, we're excited as we've been planning and trying to get things lined up for this. And we're excited to announce to you today who's going to be there singing, who's going to be there speaking, what the conference is going to look like. Uh, of course, the flyer will go out after this episode goes live. But Nate, why don't you kick us off on Thursday? So Thursday night, Jared Wilson has agreed to come in oh, and yeah. speak. Nice. Uh, very excited about that. I'll also be sharing a message that night and the JJ weeks band is going to be doing the music for us on Thursday night. Guys, this night is going to be amazing. And also earlier on Thursday, we're going to be doing a little bit of a round table recording that will go out, uh, at some point uh, as one of our episodes. So looking forward to being with the host of all the, uh, yeah. The podcast in the RFP network. That's one of the most exciting things about this is just getting everybody together. And that Thursday is going to be just, just imagine the atmosphere in that room. It's going to be electric. I'm excited. Yes. Friday morning. JJ Weeks is good. Dude, JJ Weeks is really good. My mom just sent a picture and said, do you know this guy? She was at a Tim Hawkins show and a JJ opened up for them. Like he travels with everybody. He's a, he's a good dude. So JJ Weeks is going to be great. We're excited on Friday morning. We have the president of Baptist Bible College, Mark Milioni, is going to be there with us, along with Connection Music. And uh, man, I'm fired up for y'all to get to hear Connection Music live. Uh, this is our worship team from here at Connection Church, and they have a brand new album that's going to be coming out. And uh, these guys are incredible. It's going to be leading us in worship. And so that's Friday morning. And, then and Friday we have and we have that famous podcaster, J.C. Groves, is going to be sharing a sermon that morning oh too. yeah so looking yeah, forward to that following the thursday night famous podcaster nathan cravat with <laughs> and, JJ and then friday afternoon we've got some great things lined up that we're still uh, getting worked through but the friday afternoon it's going to be an all-day event and then we're going to yeah. wrap it up friday evening brian share with us so friday night i get the privilege of serving in that service with my dad who is just an amazing preacher of God's word. As a matter of fact, guys, he's preaching on the road again since his retirement as the lead pastor. <laughs> and he told me, think about this, even at this point in his ministry, after all of these years, he's getting one to two calls a day That's awesome. for meetings. And his calendar is flooding with opportunities to go uh, and just preach God's word. And everywhere he's going, when he leaves, all the pastors are just saying, you know, they were blown away. It was incredible. They he preached Romans Man. 8 28 at a church this past week. And the pastor called me just to say it was unbelievable. Like oh. our church has, hasn't stopped talking about it. <laughs> so basically all I'm going to do is get up and say, Jesus rules and reigns. He's amazing. We love him. Here's Craig Edwards. Um, <laughs> but, but then also that night, uh, hope worship is going to be, uh, leading out in worship they do an incredible job. And man, the thing I love about them is they're just as passionate about the spiritual side of worship ministry as they are the music side of worship ministry. And so I'm excited about that. For the sake of the gospel conference coming up November 3rd and 4th at Hope Church in Danville, Virginia, Connection Music, Hope Church Worship, and the JJ Weeks Band. You got speakers, Jared Wilson, Mark Maloney, Craig Edwards, 
Brian Edwards, Nathan Cravat. I feel like a mule among thoroughbreds. This is an incredible, <laughs> too. An incredible conference. Hey, can I suggest one thing? What's that? I think on Friday night following the service and the spirit of camp meeting, and we haven't talked about this, so this is just in real time. I'll, I'll know when I listen to the episode if it got edited out, so you guys thought it was a bad <laughs> idea. But I think we need to do like something like the world's largest dessert buffet where Ooh. we get get people from all around here who just make all of these great country mountain desserts. I think it'd be awesome if we had like a 70 foot dessert table, just cram with desserts and uh, we get locally brewed coffee from Callan's coffee. And we just have a great, a great hangout time with some food, man. Done. No editing that out. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Brian Edwards promised to have a 70 foot dessert table with great coffee. I'm there, Brian. I'll deliver. I'll deliver. Awesome. Hey, I've, have... I've been there when you served food before, and it was a just like a six foot dessert table, and it was out of this world. So I can't imagine what multiple tables would look like. But yeah, man, that's going to be amazing. We might have given somebody PTSD from their IFB days when they put the gutter out there and used to fill it full of bananas and ice cream. And whipped cream. Have you ever had one of those? You ever done <laughs> I've that? heard about it. Yeah. I've heard about oh, it. And one of my first youth ministry things, I did the world's longest banana split. And we literally filled a gutter full of bananas. Wow. And ice cream and, <laughs> oh, that was well, definitely pre-COVID. <laughs> I did that one time with our teenagers and I thought it'd be funny to flick one bit of like whipped cream it was gone. The whole building got destroyed and the, and the cleaning crew called me everything but a child of God. But, you know, <laughs> everybody who's ever been to Faith Baptist camp meeting, one of the things I used to actually love, do you remember how Sammy Allen always said of the morning instead of in the morning? Of the morning. And he would talk about, you know, we're going to have that whole hog sausage. I'm talking about that whole hog <laughs> sausage and grade a eggs of the morning be here <laughs> yeah i used to love that <laughs> oh man i am so excited just to be with y'all and uh, to get to hang out with the rfp fam it's for the sake of the gospel conference danville virginia november 3rd and 4th it's only 50 dollars a person and uh, we would love for you to come registration opens up august uh, august 1st at recovering fundamentalist org. Well, guys, I'm excited about today's episode, and we've been talking a lot recently about doctrine because we recently published our statement of faith, and you would think in the church world that would be met with much applause, <laughs> and um, it really was. A lot of people were really happy with that, but some people were just not very happy with that at all, and a lot of them just don't want to let it go, but it's required to sign this statement of faith to be a part of our network. And everybody that's going to be there at the camp meeting, the conference, uh, has signed this. And and not just have they signed it, but they're excited about it. We are united in this doctrine. So almost all Christian ministries that are really making any kind of a, a serious gospel impact have a statement of faith, because there is no unity outside of the gospel. And the New Testament is clear that we must teach sound doctrine. Uh, false doctrine is warned against repeatedly in the New Testament, and believers, especially pastors and churches and ministries, we must take a stand against false doctrine. We can't tolerate it, and we certainly cannot promote it in any way. You know, Nate, not only was it bashed, there were some, some videos that were also published kind of bashing us for our statement of faith. Not kind of, they were <laughs> bashing us yeah. for that statement of faith. And the host made surprising statements in that video that have uh, some friends of theirs that are Unitarians. They said in this video regarding the Unitarians that they are, quote, some of the strongest believers of God that I know. Mm. <laughs> Yet the same Unitarians reject the Trinity, the deity of Christ, and uh, we recently uh, released some videos of these Unitarians arguing against the Trinity. And literally in that video, they clearly stated that Jesus is not God. 
First level theological issues would include those doctrines most central and essential to the Christian faith. Included among these most crucial doctrines would be doctrines such as the Trinity, the full deity and humanity of Christ, justification by faith, and the authority of Scripture. These first order doctrines represent the most fundamental truths of the Christian faith, as a denial of these doctrines represents nothing less than an eventual denial of Christianity itself. And I'm not going to lie, I disagree with that. Like, somebody such as the Trinity, the full deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, somebody cannot believe in the deity of Jesus Christ and still not deny Christianity in and of itself. Because nowhere in scripture does it say you have to affirm his deity. Now, does it make it clear that he is? I think so, yeah. Oh, yeah. But does it mean that someone's less Christian for it? Um, because they are, because actually if you listen to Unitarians, they actually have various reasons for what they believe mm -hmm. and they have ways to deal with those, proof, those other proof texts. I have some friends of mine, like I said, that are Unitarians and they are some of the strongest believers of God that I know. So, um, I disagree with them, but I'm not going to sit there and say that they are less Christian. Um, I believe they're wrong, but whatever. <laughs> uh, actually we had them on, uh, yeah. to, uh, on a Torah debate. So whatever. Shout out to alternate media. All right. Welcome to Alternate Media. I'm Seamus. I'm Bradley. Look, you know, this isn't this isn't something that we just haven't considered the Trinitarian position on when we discuss it. Um, I myself personally used to be a Trinitarian, and I no longer am. Same here. Uh, so I didn't start out Trinitarian, and then I initially became a Trinitarian for a little bit, and then by the time I left for college, I still was on the Trinitarian side. Currently, I am not. Beginning in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Yeah, so... There you go. Jesus uh, is God. <laughs> it blatantly says it. Allow me to translate this literally. Um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and God was the Word. What is the Word then? And this is to kind of break this mindset. People read John 1, and they don't actually read it. Right. They don't read that in the beginning was the word. They read, well, in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God. And that's how they read it. Like that's what they're comprehending as they're reading it rather than just reading it for what it says. You could argue that with the intention of the nation of Israel, God created the heavens and the earth. That Israel has always been kind of the master plan. Uh, and I know that that is very hard for a lot of Christians to hear that that perhaps maybe Jesus wasn't the master plan, but it was Israel with the Torah. God created the heavens and the earth. John is is literally equating Jesus to the Torah. It's fine to say that Jesus is God as much as the Torah is God. So it's not really a stretch to say that Jesus is God in a human form. But what we mean by that is that we, we don't, what we don't mean is that Jesus is God. What we mean is that Jesus is what Adam was, the made perfectly in God's image before sin entered the world. Yeah, so, John 1.1, 1, 1, not a Trinitarian yeah, passage. Spent, I have some friends of mine, like I said, that are Unitarians, and they are some of the strongest believers of God that I know. Jesus is not God. They are not equal they are not the same thing god is the creator there's there's one god the father it doesn't say there's one god father son and holy spirit it says there is one god the father somebody cannot believe in the deity of jesus christ and still not deny christianity in and of itself because nowhere in scripture does it say you have to affirm his deity jesus is not god i'm not going to sit there and say that they're less christian guys i remember the first time i saw that video you know, I almost fell out of my chair. As a matter of fact, I immediately texted you guys and I was asking the question, did you hear what they just said? You know, the Unitarians were true Christians and not just true Christians, but were among the greatest of Christians as if it wasn't necessary to believe fundamental doctrines like the Trinity or the deity of Christ. And, you know, even trying to read into what Unitarians believe, um, a, a leading Unitarian writer wrote this, that the Bible is just a human creation, a human concoction. He went on to say, now, if the Bible is the word of God, literally, or even inspired by God, God was either quite ignorant about how he made the cosmos or he, and at that time, God was definitely a he, 
chose not to bring about or brag about the awe and wonder of the Big Bang or the mysterious complexity of evolution. So wow. he's talking about God and saying of the Bible that it makes God look ignorant or either God was ignorant and even having language of being open to the idea that God is not even a he, he's not even the father, you know, that's, I mean, let's just, well, I mean, heck, if you're going to throw out the Trinity and the deity of Christ, then why not go ahead and throw out the sure, everything's open. identity of God, of course. And so the bottom line is this, what these guys are saying, it's a direct attack against scripture. I mm -hmm. never took it as an attack against the RFP. It's an attack against scripture. And, you know, for that reason, we have to, we have to boldly declare that we have a high view of scripture, that we do believe scripture is the word of God. By the way, God doesn't need to brag. He does that every day. When you look at the wonder of the world he made, <laughs> it declares his glory. If yeah. Only, I mean, maybe they don't read the Bible either, but it's heretical teaching. We need to stand against that. And, um, you know, we need to be willing to encourage people to dig into scripture, to discover what the scripture actually says. And when we do that, people who stand against scripture, that's, that's shocking. And I think that's what we're going to hear and see now. There's that. And John is an incredibly mystical book, right? Part of the background of the whole gospel of John is it is not one of the synoptic gospels at all. And it's not historical like at all there's almost uh, like if you take the skeleton okay of all of the synoptic gospels and the story of jesus right let's just take the basic outline of his life almost none of that skeleton is in john right from the, in the synoptics you know him uh a lot of his teachings a lot of the things that he does um they're almost not there john is like the black sheep of the family just it's a completely different set of, of record. Uh, it's not multiply attested. It's incredibly mystical. It's really late in its writing, and it doesn't even attempt to be a historical recording of Jesus' life. It seems to be more like uh, a, a record of theology, a way of thinking, but written in the way that history was written pretty commonly back then. Um, basically... A lot of what's said in John that is attributed to as though Jesus said it himself, it's likely he didn't say those things verbatim like that, um, but rather from John's perspective, right. that's what he meant to say. And so he records what he got out of that. Uh, so what does that mean? Right. And this is... Go ahead. Right. This, this is also another one of those instances where John is the only book that records this statement, as far as I'm aware. It is, yes. Yeah, so it's it's it, this is this is a conversation that apparently none of the other authors of the Gospels were privy to, um, so it's it is noteworthy in terms of textual criticism. This makes it stand out as something that does not fall within the boundaries of multiple attestation. Yeah, I, like uh, on my on my um, show, my independent podcast, since studies in the New Testament. From the historian's perspective, strictly speaking, you cannot, you can never say Thomas said this because it, it's simply not, it doesn't meet any of the criteria that you would use as a historian to deem it as history. Um, one, it kind of doesn't fit the context, right? Just contextually speaking, a, a Jew would never say to another Jew uh, that you are God. Uh, that's just not something that would happen. Um, so, it contextually doesn't make sense. Um, and actually, there are many Trinitarian, uh, early, early Trinitarian um, commentators who actually make this, uh, they, they have commentary on this verse, and they say explicitly, Thomas did not mean to say Jesus was God because Thomas did not yet know of the Trinity. Like, Thomas was not aware. So this, even, even though many Trinitarians today use this verse as a proof text, the early Trinitarian commentators were very specific. No, Thomas was not a Trinitarian yet. Um, so he, he did, this revelation was not yet given to him. This was, you know, an expletive uh, or or some some other explanation. So I, I just think it's, but but yeah, just strictly as a historian, you you can't you can't say he said this. Uh, the criteria of dissimilarity does it fit 
it does it sound like a Christian wrote it? It absolutely does. Uh, and so it doesn't fit dissimilarity. Um, and then multiple attestation. Does anyone else attest that he said this? No. So you have those top three criteria. It doesn't meet a single one of them. In fact, the, the I am statement, same thing. Uh, doesn't meet a single one of the three criterion uh, for historical relevance. So a lot of historians, when it comes to talking about the historical Jesus, completely leave out the book of John. Be, you know, I mean... And, can you blame him? It was written like 90 years after his life. It's the latest gospel. So naturally, every historian, especially secular historians, are going to look at it and go, it's barely credible at best. So, you know, they just kind of ignore it. But Wow. The, guys, this is why apologetics is so important. Yeah. Christian apologetics is the science of giving a defense of the Christian faith. Yes, sir. Our friends over at Explore Christianity just released a video defending the Trinity and the authenticity of the Gospel of John. You know, a lot of times Christians hear these types of attacks and don't know how to answer them. And we want you to grow in your faith and be able to give an answer for why you believe what you believe. As the mm -hmm. student college pastor here at Connection Church, we say we want you to own your faith, not just yes. your life that's on Bible stories and traditions. We want you to know why you believe what you believe. First Peter 3.15, it says, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, and yet do it with gentleness and respect. And we believe that this episode will help you love God more, trust your Bible more, and encourage you to study more. Yeah. You all ready to get this show started? I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's go. The Recovering Fundamentalist Podcast begins in three. These podcasts, <laughs> podcasts, that sounds like a convention of beans or peas to me. I don't know. Podcast. Listen, in these Recovering Fundamentalists, they don't know the Bible either. What are the fundamentals? Inerrancy, virgin birth of Jesus Christ, Amen. substitutionary atonement, Amen. bodily resurrection Amen. of Christ, and the authenticity of miracles. Hi, man! Two. I am not a recovering fundamentalist. They're everywhere. They're all over the internet. They want to be, uh, what do they call it? Recovering from fundamentalism. They're everywhere. And I think to myself, well, you were just stupid to begin with. And if there's such a word, you're stupider now. We ain't recovering from nothing, good neighbor. We're reviving from the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, man, rock time! Everybody wants to focus on recovering. Oh, you're recovering. Oh, you need yeah. help. You need therapy. You're recovering. Let's focus on fundamentalists. We're recovering fundamentalism back from people who have hijacked it. We are biblical Phew. family. We are the fundamentalist. Man. That'll make a Baptist want to speak in tongues right there, boys. One. I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, we better stay uh, in the old paths. Uh, but what are the old paths? But I, I've, I've heard that my whole life, and nobody's ever been able to tell me what the old paths or the old time religion really is because it's whatever era you mm -hmm. overly romanticize in your mind as being when the church was it, right. Mm. Like it, lump it, pump it, jump it, take it across the street and dump it. We've raised a generation that is ashamed of our forefathers and act like they were somehow done wrong in the way they were brought up and they were damaged and they were scarred because they were raised in a home that had standards and convictions and kept them on the old time way. You got their number, boys. Y'all thought you started the podcast. You went and started a movement. All right. Welcome, everybody, to Funny Truth from Explore Christianity. We're going to go ahead and just get right into it. Um, Stephen, why don't you do a tiny little introduction about yourself, and then, Jonathan, you can uh, follow that as well. Yeah, I, I'm Stephen Boyce. I'm one of the apologists with Explore Christianity. Uh, finished last year a PhD program that focused particularly on canonicity and a secondary into textual criticism. Uh, I do have a program that I do on the same exact channel going over canonical statuses of books. And uh, I also carry that into a podcast called Facts, F-A-C-T-S. 
uh, where we have recently just gone through the Gospels, did two videos for each Gospel account, and then I did one on Acts, uh, and then I also did one on Romans just yesterday, and then before that one, I did <clears throat> the pastoral epistles and the authorship behind them. Uh, I'm here in South Carolina. Like I said, it is extremely hot out here, uh, but I am enjoying life in this hot weather with my beautiful wife, Claire, my two beautiful children, Jeremiah and Kezia. But that's just a little bit about me. All right, Jonathan. Okay, well, I am Jonathan Sheffield. Uh, grew up in the Anglican Communion. Uh, also apologist at uh, Explore Christianity, also working on our campus uh, efforts uh, here in San Antonio uh, for our group. Uh, but uh, I've been in uh, apologetics probably the last six, seven years, uh, defending the, the reliability of both the New and the Old Testament. Dr. Boyce and I have collaborated on a number of uh, a uh, number of issues, especially in defending uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, we're doing a lot of research right now in defending the historicity of the Old Testament as it comes to uh, mosaic authorship. And so a lot more that will be coming out on some of the work that we're doing um, and upcoming uh, debates on the Old Testament. All right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, start playing that one video that we were going over from alternate media. And basically this is a series that they have been doing about the Trinity. And uh, we thought that it was important to just go over some of the details that they have been talking about. This is a short uh, three minute video. Basically uh, it is part of a five series video that they have done. All of them are over an hour. So, um, you know, obviously we're not gonna cover everything that they have done, but we will go over it. Um, just this tiny little part, and then hopefully in the future we might be able to cover a little bit more. There's, there's that, and, and John is an incredibly mystical book, right? Part of the background of the whole Gospel of John is it is not one of the Synoptic Gospels at all, and it's not historical, like at all. There's almost like if you take the skeleton, okay, of all of the Synoptic Gospels and the story of Jesus, right? Let's just take the basic outline of his life. Almost none of that skeleton is in John, right? From this in the synoptics, you know, him, uh, a lot of his teachings, a lot of the things that he does. Um, they're yeah, so let's there. let's pause like, right here as <clears throat> we talked about earlier, looking at John's gospel. And Jonathan, you and I have talked about this on the side even beforehand. It's kind of alarming to hear that. Like, like I guess he expects the audience to go, "Oh, wow, we didn't we didn't know that." We don't expect John to be the same as the other gospels. We actually believe that he's an independent source that's writing his own eyewitness account or having written for him his own eyewitness account. And we don't believe he's borrowing at all from the synoptic gospels. It is an independent source. It's his own eyewitness testimony. And, and it's kind of alarming to hear some of these comments because there, there's not much history that's being brought into the equation here. I actually have a quote from Clement of Alexandria, who was alive from around 150 to 215 AD. And one of the things that he tells us is how John originated. He states, John, it is said, used all the time a message which was not written down. And what really the audience needs to understand is that the gospel writers were not initially interested in writing accounts. They were orators, they were teachers, they were preachers of the gospel. Peter was not a writer, he was a speaker. Anytime you see him, he's speaking. John was not much, apparently, of a writer himself. These guys grew up, Christ, uh, you know, they were growing up as fishermen. They were not really looking to get themselves into the scholastic world with their dreams. I mean, they were simple people that were followers of Jesus, radically changed their life. And the churches are actually the ones that started pushing these guys to write their accounts. And so Mark wrote the sermons of Peter down so that they could exist past his lifetime because he was executed in the 60s. And then John, according to the Muratorian fragment, as he was getting older in his life, those that were around him in Ephesus, it says in the Muratorian fragment that elders and some of the apostles, and it lists Andrew by name, we're actually saying, John, we think you should write an account and narrate that account of what you witnessed of Jesus. And John said, well, let's pray and fast for three days. Apparently, the Lord revealed to Andrew that this should be done. He comes back and says, John, the Lord revealed to me that you should narrate this. We 
will tell the story with you. And I note that because what was being said in the Muratorian Fragment is that it was a group effort to actually publish the Gospel of John. It wasn't just John himself. And that's why at times in John's Gospel, you see we know his testimony is true. And in chapter one, it has a we as well, speaking in, in the sense of a group, because there was a group actually pushing for this to be done, a part of the surviving apostolic group. And so John was actually not really interested in writing anything or having one written. And so they were like, well, let's have you narrate one. And so there was actually a written account done by professional scribes, likely there in Ephesus to put this account together. So his message was actually an oral tradition that was being taught for years before it became written. But they realized something. The apostles, after they die, their message dies with them. But if we can get it in documentation, their legendary stories will continue through the ages. And they have. They've lasted 2,000 years almost. And then it goes on to say, at last, took to writing the following cause. The three Gospels, which had been written down before, were distributed to all, including himself. So this is what Clement of Alexandria is telling us. John had access to the other Gospels. He had the synoptics on hand. And and according to Clement, it is said that he welcomed them and testified of their truth. It's not like this writer of John didn't know anything about the synoptics. And, and, uh, well, man, I forgot. I, I should have followed their lead over here. He was very familiar and even gave testimony to their realities and truths and said these these accounts are true, but said that there was only lacking to the narrative the account of which was done by Christ at first at the beginning of the preaching. Now, here's the thing that he also said in the video that I found extremely interesting. He said that John isn't historical like at all. It is probably the most chronological of the historical narratives of Jesus's life. Uh, Papias tells us that Mark actually wrote down Peter's sermons for him, and they were not in a particular order. They were not orderly accounts. But John took upon himself to start with the very first miracle and actually gave chronological order to Jesus's miracles. It says that he turned the water into the wine there in the wedding of Cana. And so this is the first of Jesus's miracles that glorified himself. And then it says, this is the second. He's actually doing a chronological history of the life and ministry of Jesus. As far as the differences go, that's where Clement gives this last line. They say accordingly that John was asked to relate in his own gospel, the period passed over in silence by the former evangelists. They actually wanted John to not follow what was already being published because they already had three of those accounts. And I know that Jonathan and I actually agree with this, that predominantly the main eyewitness testimony behind the other three gospels is based out of Peter's eyewitness testimony. I, I happen to believe Mark's Greek gospel was first. I know that Jonathan and I have different semantics of this, but Either way, we both conclude that the summary and the main eyewitness testimony behind the three synoptics is really based on what Peter's testimony was. And and rightfully so. Peter was one of the three of the apostles. He was there in the inner circle with Jesus. But there were two other guys in that inner circle too. James, the brother of John, who died and was executed very early on in the origin of the church. So that leaves you John, who has another perspective here. And the elders in Ephesus believed that it was time that John filled in some gaps, the times that are passed over in silence, as Clement says. And so John is not trying to follow the synoptics, and he doesn't need to. Uh, Luke, on the other hand, would have needed to do this. Luke was somebody who was not there. Mark had to go off of the dictation of Peter because he was not there. Papia said he neither heard the Lord nor he saw him. And then you have Luke, who as well never heard him nor saw him. He went to the eyewitnesses and published under the authority of Paul a gospel with Peter's main testimony from Mark, in addition to what he learned from those in Antioch and Jerusalem when his visits there. And he published a work on the basis of their eyewitness testimony. So he could not give an independent source in of himself because he wasn't there. Whereas John was there and he was there at events that were far beyond anything that anybody else could have known. For example, when you go to the story of the tomb, two disciples ran to that tomb. Peter ran there and John ran there. So Peter had a viewpoint, John had a viewpoint. You look at the crucifixion narrative right before that, two disciples followed Jesus to the cross. One 
under disguise and into the point where he was actually kind of lagging along behind. But when he was pressed, denied the Lord three times. Peter was at the campfire. He was following closely behind. But John was there getting them entrance into the temple, uh, into the time of where he was being tried outside of the temple courts. And he was also there at the foot of the cross and holding a weeping mother of Jesus and being told, this is your mother and looking at his mother and saying, this is your son. John was there for that. Peter was not, no, nor were the others. John's story needed to be told and he was getting older. And so they put it into a written form. So John has an independent source that the churches believed needed to be noted by those who would come in the ages after the apostles teaching. So nobody's denying the differences. Nobody's denying that it's not there. However, the statement about the historical chronology, and that's not historical at all, is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, it is extremely historical, and it is in order more than any of the other three Gospels. Jonathan, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, no, thanks, Dr. Boy. I think that was an excellent uh, overview. And I think one of the things uh, that we talk about as far as chronology that we picked up, uh, Eusebius also explains that John had no genealogy because he had already been uh, handled by Matthew and, and Luke. So that's what we're finding in there as well. Uh, and I think one of the big points that you make about chronology that it seemed like uh, that channel wasn't aware of is that uh, when we look at uh, the chronology itself, uh, the synoptics are writing, um, you know, uh, from Christ's ministry from the death of John the Baptist. And this is where uh, when you talk about these particular gaps, uh, this is where John is beginning uh, to start with the work of Christ uh, before this time. Uh, so, you know, he kind of relates to what he did before John the Baptist had been thrown into prison. But, you know, the other three evangelists narrate the events after the imprisonment of the Baptist. So he is giving us a much fuller account. Um, and I think, you know, one of the important things that uh, you began with, Dr. Boyce, is uh, you're bringing forth a document that was collected uh, from the second century, uh, you know, from a member of the uh, Church of Alexandria. Uh, what we do know from Eusebius is that the Gospel of John was written, uh, was read in all churches. And we have a relevant witness from the Church of Alexandria giving us a document of the historical reasons uh, why he went out. And, and I think what we find in this chapter, too, is not only does uh, Clement go over, you know, why John wrote, but he explains why Matthew wrote, uh, why Mark, uh, he touches on Mark a little bit and goes into why Luke wrote his uh, gospel. So uh, I, I think one of my concern here. Uh, in looking at the uh, uh, the comments uh, made uh, by these commentators is there's no foundation for any of their assertions, whereas, Dr. Boyce, you're bringing in uh, an actual document from the ancient world from a relevant witness that would have this information, which actually answers this question, which kind of begs the question, are they even aware of this document? And are they actually familiar with church, uh, Eusebius church history, which actually addresses all these questions that they were bringing up? Yeah, and then I think at the end of the day, again, what Jonathan and I are saying is, is John was an independent source. He was giving his own eyewitness testimony. And even the early churches like Clement or Eusebius, who's a court historian, and there's others, Irenaeus testifies of all these things. Uh, and Irenaeus has quite an opinion, and he should, because he was trained by a man who was trained by John. He was trained and left at uh, his location with the guidance and the instruction that he learned from Polycarp, who was the Bishop of Smyrna, who was commissioned there by John the Apostle himself. So naturally, you would expect that somebody that close to John would have had a lot to say about the Gospel of John. He did, and so did Tertullian and others. So uh, they all have comments. And again, we even have the Muratorian Fragment. Uh, the anti-Martianite prologue, all of these things attest to John as actually being an independent eyewitness from his viewpoint and that it was actually a group gospel. And, and I think it's uh, ironic because when you look at the Miratorian fragment, for example, it says that other apostles were there. And what is the first apostle that's mentioned in the Miratorian fragment? Andrew. 
Who's the first apostle that's on the scene with the anonymous disciple that if you follow that trail all the way through the Gospel of John, it's a disciple who Jesus loved. It was John and Andrew who met Jesus first, and it was Andrew that brought Peter to Jesus. These are the scenes that what John's Gospel covers those gaps that the others don't, and they couldn't. Of course, they, if, if Mark's based on Peter, Peter can't tell you what happened before Andrew came and brought him in. Uh, if it's based on what Luke investigated from the others, he's following also Peter's lead there through the gospel of Mark, following Mark. If they're following that trend, they're not going to know. None of the other apostles are going to know what happened with John the Baptist. And in their first introduction to Jesus, where he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the earth, uh, the world. And then they spend a, a evening in the tent with Jesus. Only two disciples were there and could tell that story. The anonymous disciple who ends up being the disciple who Jesus loved because he's using good first century biography work, not including himself or his name. He just uses a cryptic name in order to give himself credibility as the writer, as well as the author, but also not giving away his position to steal the limelight there from Jesus, who he's writing a biography of, which is, again, consistent with first century writings. But in that, he gives himself this code name, and it is him and Andrew that are there first. And he tells Andrew's story. John tells stories of the other apostles that were not told in the synoptics. He tells Judas not Iscariot. Judas not Iscariot gets no speaking points in any of the synoptics, but he gets one line speaking point in John's gospel. Thomas gets an entire experience story of what happened with him and Jesus after the resurrection that are not in the synoptics. John gets to tell the story of Nathaniel that are not in the synoptics. He gets to tell the story on the other group. And again, I think it was a group effort to make the gospel of John. I think John was the main narrator behind it with his main eyewitness testimony, but I think he brought in his friends and their stories and published it with their stories. And that's why you see the story of Nathaniel. That's why you see the story of Andrew. You see the story of Judas, not as scary. You see the story of Thomas because he was able to publish that because he was there and he knew these men and they were there with him and they were trying to get the message out and to cover the things the synoptics did not cover. So yes, there's going to be a completely different platform when you have that set up versus what the synoptics were going for black sheep of the family just it's a completely different set of of record uh it's not multiply attested it's incredibly mystical it's really late in its writing and it doesn't even attempt to be a historical recording of jesus life okay we're gonna uh, we're gonna stop there again we're not even gonna <laughs> let him get one sentence in here um so it's not early attested it's late well, yeah, I, again, J Jonathan and I differ on this a little bit. Jonathan would place the gospel of John somewhere between 68 and 70. I would imagine I placed John's gospel between 80 and 90 AD. Jonathan, is that about the right year? Am I speaking well of your date? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, you know, one of the, uh, the main points that I focus on is, um, you know, can sort of understand the time that John was at Ephesus, where it was published, uh, where he spent his time before his uh, before his exile. Um, you know, so I, I think in uh, you know when we look at that, uh, the testimony where he written, uh, and also the fact that uh, I know uh, Robinson makes this point too. He, he doesn't speak. Uh, to the destruction or reference in any point when speaking of Jerusalem, uh, it's destruction, uh, which is another point that kind of leads me before the 70 still speaks as if uh, Jerusalem is still there well and uh, doesn't reference its destruction at all. Yeah. So, and, and obviously he and I differ. We've had fun conversations on the side about that. And my main statement is he's telling a story of the past before the destruction is and interested in the destruction, but I but think the, we would the, all. Uh, yeah, the attestation, would, I think, is where we would both agree. I think you brought up. And it's fourth. Know, yeah. And it's the fourth gospel. Yeah, and, and I think there's no dispute on this. Eusebius mentions that it was read in all the churches. Uh, there really wasn't any doubt that it was the fourth gospel published. Uh, the other common historical point is it was published at Ephesus. So yes. from all the relevant witnesses, we have that. Um, and we have common history 
I mean, the, as you mentioned, Dr. Boyce, the Muratorian fragment, which is coming out from Rome. We have Clement of Alexandria, another witness of an yep. apostolic church in the second century. We have Irenaeus at Asia Minor. And once again, Irenaeus has great credibility in the sense that the person who taught him was trained by John the Apostle and appointed there. So we we have very similar testimony in North Africa. So the, the yeah, Tertullian. The yeah. yeah. So the the history is common. It's well attested. Uh, so I, I'll let you kind of move on from there. But no, I, I and you're of, right. Yeah, it's not one location. You have Egypt. You have Rome. You have you even have the anti-Marcionite prologue, which we don't know even where that potentially came from in of itself. There's theories behind it, but yeah, I mean, you got the East, you got the West, you got the South. I mean, every church level by the second century has a, an entire story of how John's gospel came into existence. And they're all saying the same thing. If you read Irenaeus's story of how John came into existence, it is very in line with what was said in the anti-Martianite prologue. And if you look at what's in the anti-Martianite prologue and you go down and you read what Tertullian says, they're saying the same thing in North Africa. It's not a different story about how it came to be. And to say that it wasn't well attested early on is a little bit uh, mind-blowing as well. And, and I've demonstrated this in my doctoral work and my research from Codex H, which has some of the early church documents, including the most famous one in that manuscript is the Didache. And the Didache is first century. I would place the Didache between 90 and 96. Some actually would go a little bit earlier than that. I, I, I personally would not. But 90 to 96 AD, the Didache actually quotes from John's gospel. So you have a first century document claiming to be from the apostles, which quotes Matthew almost 30 times by itself. But there's this one time it does include a Johannine citation into the first century quoting from John's gospel. Then you have Ignatius. Uh, who was writing in his letters, and he mentions John chapter 3, the very famous story when Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. He tells the church at Philadelphia when he's writing, because remember, he wrote these seven letters. I believe there's seven uh, authentic letters from him. He's on his way to be executed. He writes a letter to Polycarp. He tells Polycarp to publish these letters for him. He goes to the Colosseums. He's executed and killed. In his letter to the Philadelphians, he quotes John 3, 8, where he says, for he knows where it comes and where it goes, talking about the wind, which is in the story of John 3 with Nicodemus. You have Ignatius, which is probably between 100 and 110, giving a story and referring to John 3 as the basis of his statement to the church at Philadelphia. So it is early attested. It is quoted. It is aligned with all these apostolic fathers. It is in the patristic writings. And it's in the first century. It's in the first, in the earliest parts of the second century. And again, I, I happen to believe John's between 80 and 90. And if that's the case, and the Didache is between 90 and 96, you're talking about as early as five, six years and is up to 15 years before it's already being quoted and circulated by documents from apostolic people. And then you go to Ignatius, which is just a few years after that. Okay, let's just say that John's gospel is 68 to 70 AD. Uh, Jonathan and I would agree the apocalypse is probably later than that. And John was alive at the turn of the century. Ignatius was alive the same time John was alive. And in that distribution, as he's writing his letters to be executed on his way to Rome, he's quoting from a living apostle that was either just had died or was alive in his lifetime. He's already attributing works to his apostolic text. So it is early attested. I'm not sure where they're getting that information from. It's just not accurate. Of Jesus' life, it seems to be more like uh, a a record of theology, a way of thinking, but written in the way that history was written pretty commonly back then. Um, that basically, a lot of what's said in John that is attributed to it as though Jesus said it himself. It's likely he didn't say those things verbatim like that. Um, but rather from John's perspective, that's what he meant to say. And so he records what he got out of that. Okay. All right. So hold, hold tight right there. That is actually not an inaccurate statement. Um, in fact, Clement of Alexandria again, helps us with this, this dilemma. Uh, Clement wrote 
but John, the last of all, seeing that was bodily set forth in the Gospels on the entreaty of his intimate friends and inspired by a, by the Spirit, composed a spiritual gospel. Now, these guys are wrongly defining what that is meant. And maybe they're familiar with that terminology, and that's where he's coming up with the term mystic or this spiritual idea. Um, but I love what Burskog says about this. He says that the eyewitnesses were as much interpreters as they were observers. And you find this consistent in the writings of John, where you do see John coming along and he is listening and he's observing and he's paying attention to what's being done in the scene. And he then begins as he grew older to understand. In fact, he admits in the writings, Jesus did these things, but his disciples did not understand these things until he was glorified. You see this in chapter 12. You see this early on in chapter number four. You see these terminologies used by John all the time. The disciples did not understand these things until he was glorified. So yes, John was, in a sense, not just a recorder or an eyewitness, but he was an interpreter of what he was seeing. Now, the question is, and Jonathan, this becomes an issue of apostolic authority, is if John is writing this, does he have the right to interpret what he saw and understood as being trained? Because Jesus ultimately was not just trying to give them some storylines to tell later. In fact, this is brought out in chapter 14 of John. Jesus went so far as to say that when you get to a point, the spirit, the helper, the paraclete will come to you and he will bring back to remembrance things that were said and that were done. So the Holy Spirit was told to them that he would come and help them and bring back to memory these things. But there's multiple times where the writer is admitting we didn't understand this at the time. At that time when this was said, we didn't understand it, but then we did understand it later because then it was brought to light. So there was a message that Jesus always had for them. He was trying to tell them. He was trying to teach them. But in the blindness that they were experiencing due to little faith, and how many times did Jesus say, oh, you have little faith? Because they weren't understanding what he was meaning. It wasn't that they were just trying to understand what he was doing. Jesus was trying to get them to understand what he also meant in by what he was doing. So yes, John was interpreting what Jesus was doing because that's what Jesus was trying to get across to them the whole time. And they didn't get it until after the resurrection, until after his glorification, then the things that they saw began to make sense. And now they're able to write with authority, and I'm using that word carefully, authority to interpret what Jesus said because they were commissioned to do that very thing. That is part of the apostolic role. Jonathan, you're a great Anglican. Why don't you chime in on that aspect of, did John have the right to interpret, not only tell what Jesus did as Burskog said? Yeah, no, I, I think you hit that point right on the head. And, and I think what we see from Eusebius as well, uh, that they really didn't aspire to represent the teachings of the master, you know, Jesus uh, in a persuasive or artistic language. But they relied on the Holy Spirit uh, to help them in this regard. Now, um, I, uh, so from his standpoint, just like any other witness, they're writing from their vantage point. Uh, now, given, you know, he he obviously uh, did have help in this. He did have his scribes uh, and obviously people in Ephesus. I think one of the things uh, that uh, this author, or this commentator brings up is like he's bringing out a theological work. And I think it's important to understand that uh, he was at Ephesus, you know, uh, the great schools of Ephesus and philosophy. Uh, so. Obviously, there is going to be sort of this uh, philosophic or uh, theological uh, theme. You know, you got great scribes over there. Uh, so this is what we would expect to see, obviously, if something's bringing out uh, this. But uh, yes, as an eyewitness, as someone being commissioned, he was appointed uh, to write this. And, and what we've seen is that this work was not only received, but 
read in every single uh, one of the churches. And uh, so he did have the authority uh, to do this. We also see that all the other churches read this gospel as well. So they accepted it as well. Uh, so, I mean, this, this is read in the Western churches and the Eastern churches and the Aramaic. Uh, and there was never any dispute about this. So in, in terms of style, uh, from the vantage point of John, where he's writing from, everything is consistent with the testimony that is being said. That's a great point, uh, by the way, about Ephesus being the academic institution of the Greco-Roman Empire of that time, uh, dealing with the main headquarters of education and, and thought and philosophy. Yeah, he's going to be writing to the immediate audience that he is going to be giving this letter to and this, this narrative to. And his scribes probably helped him with that. Again, I mean, John was probably more of a, you know, he's probably that old man that tells the same stories 500 times over and over again. And he's got professional scribes that are coming. And, and I, again, I, I think that's probably the way this went. John was an elderly man. And, uh, you know, and there's been many studies, I actually want to bring this up. There's been many studies that talk about, well, could somebody that much long later, because they just kept bringing this up in the video. Well, this is later, this is later. And it sounds like they don't believe John wrote it from my perspective of listening to them. But even if it was John later in life, the criticism is, well, he would have been too far removed. He wouldn't remember that. It's like, wait a minute. Okay. I have a grandfather that's going on 80 years old. And before that, on my dad's side, I had a grandfather who lived into his nineties and they had the highlighted stories of their life from the time they were kids, teenagers, where they told the story. And you knew when you went to your grandparents' house for holidays, you were going to hear the same story again and again and again, the same way you can retell the story yourself after it's done. And, and many of you in the audience know what I'm talking about with your family. You know the jokes they're going to tell, you know the pun line, you know everything because you've heard it over and over and over again. And they're doing that into their 70s, 80s, and 90 years old. John had been telling these stories his whole entire life after meeting with Jesus. He was not going to just, oh man, I forgot all about that kind of ordeal. He's telling the same stories over and over again. He wouldn't have forgotten that. Jonathan, go ahead. John, you were about to say something. Yeah, and, and I think we, and that's an excellent point that you bring up. And because I know that's sort of the counter narrative, how much would he have really remembered? But we do have a document from Irenaeus, uh, and Eusebius publishes this, uh, his letter to Florinius. Uh, and it talks about who Irenaeus at this time writing in 180 AD is, you know, much older himself, recounts how in his early age, uh, he remembers Polycarp, who was an eyewitness to John, explaining in specific detail how much he remembered and how much Polycarp would talk about all this stuff that John remembered and all the stuff that they had been taught by the apostles. And so we actually have an ancient document from the second century that speaks to how well they did remember. Uh, and, you know, Irenaeus talks about how he remembered this from his youth. He can account where Polycarp was actually sitting when he told uh, these accounts and all the information that John the Apostle and the other apostles would share with them. So yep. once again... It's consistent with your point, Dr. Boyce, that uh, that's all they had was these memories uh, to go off of. And in and, that uh, same timeline with Clement, they also said this is a spiritual gospel. And that is, that's not, a, that's not a, like an unknown factor that's just now being, oh, wow, I didn't realize that. They knew that in the second century within 60 years of John writing the gospel. They called it a spiritual gospel because he did do interpretive work, not just eyewitness work. And as we've just been saying, he had every right to do so. He was commissioned to do so. Jesus spent his whole ministry trying to get them to understand the meaning behind what he said, the meaning behind what he did. And they didn't get it until he was glorified. Then something clicked. And it radically changed them. And you can see that very early on at Pentecost. It radically changed Peter. It radically changed John, who was there with Peter and all the apostles. And then it absolutely radically changed. That's exactly what Paul does in a lot of his letters. He gets the spiritual concept behind the law and behind these things. They were going for more than just repeat. They were going for repeat with meaning. And they were commissioned to do so. That was their apostolic duty. 
All right. And one of the things that I was thinking about is, uh, and it is something that you guys can think about for the end of the, the show is, why is it that a lot of people like to attack the gospel of John out of all the other ones, even if like, you know, they come from different groups and, and they, uh, you know, they will say, oh, we're Christian, but from another sect or something like that. Like their main point is almost like always to attack the gospel of John. So I, I or think it's that's theology. Clear. Because yeah. of its theology. It's very obvious. And we're only like 30 seconds into their clip. And they have five entire videos. They have an issue with the theology. Um, I watched them do a video early on. Actually, Dr. James White uh, responded to their interpretation of John 1. And totally dismantled their interpretation. Because they uh, were trying to get into the Greek. And and, and and I'm not trying to be unkind. But they they butchered it so badly. And, and Dr. White demonstrated that in his video. So they're trying to go after, well, this is a, this is an interpretation. This isn't what Jesus was actually saying. That's what John thinks Jesus was saying. Or the, and again, I don't think they actually think John did it, but they're going off of, this is an interpretation of what it said. We don't know if Jesus actually said that or not, or if that's just John's opinion of what Jesus said. And, uh, and again, there's so many things in there that indicate to me that the issue with John is the concept of his deity, which I find is ironic. And Santi, you know this, uh, you are actually at a apologetic conference with Samuel Neeson from the country of Malaysia with me here in South Carolina. And Santi did a, uh, Santi, you heard Samuel do a wonderful job of showing the deity of Christ in the other synoptic, in the synoptics. It's not like, well, the whole entire doctrine of the deity of Christ is completely hinging on the gospel of John. Um, no, that's not true at all. And the early church wasn't always using John's gospel to defend the deity or even the Trinity itself. They were using passages like in Matthew uh, 28. They, I mean, they were going after passages to defend Christ's deity, even within the synoptic narratives, very early on in the church, the defense of these things. So uh, it seems to me like the main issue is the theology as if that's the only gospel that has that theology. And that's been dismantled over and over again. Uh, but I, I, that's what I believe is happening here. I don't know about Jonathan's view, but that's exactly what it looks like to me. Yeah, I, I, I think this is where the center of attack really comes into. Uh, they sort of look at John's gospel as a theological evolution or enlightenment of mm -hmm. the others, a sort of, uh, you know, uh, and I think this is where they begin with uh, the fact that, you know, oh, it's so different. It's not covering the same time frame. Uh, he's really covering other sections that are not found in here. And so they're trying to place discredit on it. But I think the underlying foundation is, actually, as Dr. Boyce stated, it, it's the of the theological persuasion uh, because it's, I mean, it's very clear in John. But once again, he's writing to a specific office uh you know in a sort of theological rich community uh in a way that they would understand so we obviously understand the literary design um but speaking on this particular issue so i, I think it was key for him uh to do this but uh the central issue is the theological foundation that makes up john there's no escape from it you can sort of try to um try to navigate an argument, uh, you know, around Mark, um, you know, and, and how they do with the other synoptics. But uh, it, it's very clear what's being stated in John. And, you know, John, as uh, Clement and Eusebius tell us, you know, wanted to convey some of the things that are left out and be a little more specific on these things and convey in a manner that, uh, you know, <laughs> the height of the education of the Greek world uh, would understand. All right. Oh, well, let's go and try to play a little bit more. Right. This this is also another one of those instances where John is the only book that records this statement, as far as I'm aware. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's it, this is this is a conversation that so what the other authors of the gospels were. I, I mean, so so what? I mean, he's an independent so, witness. He he's... has every right to. Uh, make a statement about what he heard. You do realize there, like Luke is the only 
gospel writer to tell the story of the Good Samaritan. He's the only one. Matthew doesn't tell the story. Mark doesn't tell the story. Do you realize that Luke is the only one to tell you the parable of the lost son and the prodigal son story? So what? Like, that doesn't mean it's not true just because they're the only one that says it. There's things in Mark's gospel that are not in Matthew's gospel. There's things in Matthew's gospel that are not in Matthew or in Mark or in Luke. What's the point? What are we getting at here? I don't understand. Again, this goes back to what is the basis of these texts to you? Do you believe they came from the apostles or the eyewitnesses themselves? There are different views of this. I understand that. I mean, you have guys like the the Anglican that I wish the Anglican on this panel would become more like Richard Bauckham. Uh, you know, jo Jonathan's inspiring to be him eventually, we hope. Uh, but uh, Richard Bauckham, the w wonderful Anglican, he doesn't actually believe that John is written by John the Apostle. He believes he's written by John the Elder. Now, I, I don't necessarily agree with him, but Bauckham is brilliant. And he demonstrates in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses a tremendous defense of the eyewitness testimony. But here's what he does believe. It is written by somebody who was there. Uh, now, again, it, it really doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't matter to me if John's the only one that says it. No more does it matter to me that Luke is the only one that records it or that Mark is the only one that records it. It doesn't matter to me. The question is, is who originated the statement and said, Jesus said this or Jesus did that? If it's Peter, then I'm going to take his word for it because he was there. It doesn't matter if Luke didn't decide to record it. It doesn't matter if Matthew didn't decide to record it or John didn't decide to record it. Just like it doesn't matter to me that Matthew and, and Mark didn't tell the parable of the prodigal son. Which, by the way, if you study that very carefully, as uh, our good friend Samuel Neeson demonstrated, you find the deity of Christ in the story of the prodigal son. Uh, but in that story, it is only Lucan. But he got it from the eyewitnesses because he wasn't there. So it doesn't matter. He got it from his investigation and he found it fitting to the audience he was intending to write to and give to and publish for the teaching of Paul's ministry. So this idea that, well, he's the only one that said it is, is totally irrelevant if the guy was there. It doesn't matter. You don't need 500 people to say it for it to be true. If the man was there and he heard Jesus say it, that's all that matters. Sorry, I got a little excited there, Jonathan, but... Uh, uh, you, you can chime in on that too. That just that that kind of thing just bothers me. Like as if the other synoptics don't have individual citations that are unique to themselves. Like of course, that happens. yeah. And, and I think this is one of the points that John Chrysostom makes that which shows the independence of the record that they weren't yes. conspiring together uh, on these accounts. Uh, this is what you expect to see in witness testimony across the board. And John Chrysostom in his opening prologue to the Gospel of Matthew makes this very point. Because when we're looking at these accounts, uh, and when we look and we see that there's a lot of things consistent, but there are differences which shows that they're independent of one another. And this is what we expect to see in any normal court of law. Uh, the, the main life uh, or the birth, uh, the, the life, the death, and the resurrection are all common uh, with these uh, narratives, the, the resurrection accounts. There are so many aspects of what we expect to see in witness testimony is these main elements agreeing. But what further uh, John Chrysostom talks about is the evidence of their independence is quite shown because w what you expect to see when you have a conspiracy or someone colludes together is everything is the same. And here we have these noticeable differences that you expect in witness statements that are writing from different perspectives. And as uh, Dr. Boyce mentioned, they're writing to different audiences. What is going to appeal to different audiences? Obviously, Matthew to the Jews, uh, John to the people at Rome, and uh, or uh, John Mark uh, to the people of Rome uh, from Peter's sermons. Uh, you know, Paul, uh, Luke to the Gentiles, and obviously John has a specific uh, design to capture. So. Um, we see the independence, we see um, the different approach and who their audiences were, and this is what we expect to see, which yep. goes to uh, th the matter of truth. It shows the independence, 
and uh, um, the agreement in these accounts. Yeah, and, and, and this is significant. It yeah, it's significant because what you just said is so true, Jonathan. When you're talking about these writers, Luke is going after a more Gentile uh, people because he's traveling with Paul to the Gentiles, who's the apostle to the Gentiles. And so he's going to tell stories that are significant because the whole entire narrative of Luke is that Jesus is going after these undesirable people. He's going after the Samaritan. He's going after the maim and the lame and the dumb and the blind. He's going after women uh, th th to heal them and cast out their demons and let them become followers. I mean, what, what was being given by Luke who's going after Gentiles saying Christ came to go after people that were once undesirable or despicable to society, the gospel is for you. Naturally, he's going to hone in on stories that are relevant to Jesus trying to include the outside. And then he even gives parables to this. Like you have this guy named Lazarus in chapter 16 of Luke, who is an outsider. He's somebody that was not a part of Abraham's uh, descendancy, but of one of his servants' descendancies, that same name for Lazarus there. Um, used in the Septuagint going back to Genesis, but he's in the kingdom, but a child of Abraham is not. A Jew is excluded in Luke 16, but an outsider is resting in the bosom of Abraham. This was a gospel to the outsider. So naturally, Luke's going to follow that kind of a story more than Matthew, who's writing to a predominantly Jewish congregation, and Mark, who's just simply recording an oral tradition sermon of Peter telling the life and ministry of Jesus in a very cut-paste way. John is, on the other hand, coming in. He's dealing with other elements, which is, again, why I, I personally believe it's a little bit later. He's dealing with Gnosticism that has now come into the church. He, he combats it in 1 John. He has to deal with it at the beginning of his premise uh, in, in, in John 1, and then he also deals with it in the theology in itself. Remember, and, and you mentioned this, Jonathan, a minute ago, Irenaeus telling stories of Polycarp. One of the stories he tells of Polycarp is when Polycarp and John were in Ephesus one day, I guess they all went to public hot tubs or something. They went to, you know, get a little sweat in at the, the national, you know, Ephesus saunas. They ran into Cerinthian uh, of Cerinthianism and had an encounter and John like had a meltdown about it. So John was battling in Ephesus, a teaching that was diminishing the deity of Christ. So naturally He's going to bring in, hey, I was there, as he said in First John, that which we have seen, that which we have touched, that which we have heard, we have experienced with our own hands and our eyes and our ears, the word of life. He's going to give you a message about who Jesus was, why he was there. Serenthian was not there, he was there. So he gets to dictate what Jesus was actually meaning because he was there and Jesus was, he was there by his breast. Jesus said things to him that none of us know. He was there in the audience when Jesus was doing things that were not recorded by any of the apostles. He was there when Jesus was close to him and, and, and in a close encounter to him and telling him things. He knew more about Jesus than anybody else that wasn't with him could ever hope to. So he is qualified to say the word was with God and the word was God. He has every right to say that because he was with the word and touched the word and saw the word and heard the word in his ministry. And his audience needed that affirmation from John because they were being torn in Ephesus between Serinthianism and his teaching. And he, right out the gate, makes it clear who Jesus was. He was from the beginning, and he was with God and was God, and that he became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And we, there's that plural writing on behalf of the group, beheld his glory. To me, John is already making a defense because the city of Ephesus, by the time he's writing a narrative of Jesus, needed clarity on who the apostles believed Jesus was. And from them who heard him saying it meant more than Serinthian who was not with Jesus saying it. So this was a, again, what Jonathan just said is vital. The audience does matter and they will pick in on certain things of the ministry of Jesus that were necessary for their current audience at hand. I guess we could play a little bit more of the video. We have a few minutes here. Um, we I don't think we got past 30 seconds, guys. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Um, I think we're like 30 seconds into this thing. And we're already sweating and, and fired up and, and uh, you know, annoyed and everything else. So we'll go ahead and pull right. that back up, uh, Santi, and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll see what we can get, how, how much longer we can go. <laughs> 
in terms of textual criticism, this makes it stand out as something that does not fall within the boundaries of multiple attestation. Yeah, I, like uh, on my... Well, let's pause right here. All right. Okay. All right. So, wow. Yeah, we're, we got a 34 seconds, everybody. Uh, maybe I missed this. Maybe we can uh, discuss it. So I, I'm not sure where textual criticism has any relevance to this. What, I, I, what in the world I, is he even talking about? What I think he's saying, it, just to combine his previous statement where he says, well, John is the only one uh, that says this, and there's no multiple attestation from the other writers uh, that, uh, that that bring this reference up into that statement. So I think we said, but it's not, textual criticism is looking for the mm. original work. It's comparing yeah. uh, the manuscripts that are extant and finding the variance between the manuscripts, but uh, and, and Dr. Boyce, I know this is more uh, your expertise, <laughs> but uh, regarding that particular statement uh, where he says, well, this is only quoted by John, it's not a text critical issue because he hasn't brought up all these different extant manuscripts right. that have different readings or don't have that reading in there. Right. That's when it becomes a text critical issue. What he's making is he made a statement um, and what he's trying to say is we can't corroborate that. Corroborate it. But yes. I, I think what, what it has to do, though, like th there's a confusion. And I, I know this is what you're pointing out. The confusion here is that he's trying to say that this is a problem within the textual criticism part because the other Gospels don't attest to some of the stories. I, that's my understanding of what he's That's still to not say. textual criticism. Right. Yeah. Textual and, criticism and, is an attempt of recapturing the initial text's wording. Right. But which, by the way, we the earliest manuscripts we have of the New, T New Testament cover guess which gospel? John uh, right. in P66. P52 is probably one of the oldest manuscripts we have. P75. All of these are second century manuscripts that cover the gospel of John. And two of those, P66, P75, uh, cover John 1. And, and both of them say the word was with God and the word was God. And textual variant, which we're not going to get in this debate here, later in that same section, the older manuscripts also not only say that, they say that he was the monogonese theos. He was the unique God, if you would. They they flat, whereas some of the other later manuscripts actually have huios, son, there. Um, the earliest attestation in the textual critical world of John's gospel actually plainly calls Jesus God. I mean, it calls him God in verse one as well, but it plainly calls him God. So I just find this ironic that the word textual criticism comes in here, which is not textual criticism. And that if you do bring textual criticism in here to recapture, you have manuscripts of John's gospel are the earliest, some of the earliest manuscripts we have the whole New Testament. And they're within, if, again, if John is 80 and 90 AD, they're within 80 years of the original initial text. And they're yeah. telling us the same thing that Jesus was the word and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and that he was from the beginning and that he was God. They're saying the same thing our English translations say. G go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, no, and I think that this is an excellent point because uh, I think they're really confused on this issue. First, they don't have a competing statement that says something different uh, that, uh, you know, uh, Obviously, if we look at the histories on Alexander the Great with Ptolemy and Aristobulus, uh, there were some statements uh, around the same battles uh, that they were at where they gave conflicting accounts. Now, uh, there's no conflicting account here because there's no what, what they're trying to say is, well, we, we can't corroborate in other accounts. So they're they're making an argument from silence. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and as we've been talking about, this is not a text critical issue in the sense of, you know, the manuscripts are pretty consistent on there. So they don't have any real known variants on this particular point. So I, I think what we, uh, and, and maybe they're just not sure and they're just trying to use a big word, but it's not a text critical issue at all. Uh, they're operating mainly from an argument from silence. They don't have a conflicting statement uh, just because he, he's making, he's, he's addressing a specific issue to a specific audience uh, that the others did not have to address. 
Um, this is why he's coming out with it. So it kind of fits the context, what he was dealing with. It's over in Ephesus. It's kind of this theological masterpiece uh, that we see coming out of the schools. But uh, yeah, very confused by that statement uh, that they made. And what was that? There was a comment that came up. I, I Did you pull a comment up? Did I see a comment, Santi? Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So uh, I think actually James White actually demonstrated this in that video, if I'm not mistaken, about the Caldwell's rule of John 1.1, 1, 1, because they were talking about the interpretation, if you read it literally. Um, the word was God. It was actually, and they have it, God was the word, and then they got into the whole the part there, the article. And I, I hate to use the word definite article in Greek because it's not the same way that we do articles in English, et cetera. But what, it, what uh, Linguas Ammo, and I'm sorry if I just butchered your name, is saying is that Caldwell came up with this idea after studying the Greek that the definite uh, predicate nouns that come before a verb, how that usage is with the article before that noun and how it is used or not used and included or not included, he gives the entire demonstration of how in the Greek language this is a regular thing, which is why we don't say uh, a God or the God as the JWs tried to insert in their English <laughs> translation because they're not including this idea because you have the, the noun there, that predicate noun that comes before the verb. That's exactly, I believe, what uh, they were confused about in that video. And I'm pretty sure, I could be wrong, Santi, I don't know if you saw it or not, but I'm pretty sure actually James White covered that a little bit in that video too. But it's it's all about that. It's understanding the Greek. It's understanding the structure. These different rules. These different guidelines that that w we find consistency in Greco writing, especially Koine Greek. That was one of those things there. So I believe that's what um, uh, is being talked about in the comment there. It's a good point. It's a great right. comment from the audience. All right, let's let's try to go another four seconds, shall we? <clears throat> all right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. From the historian's perspective, strictly speaking, you cannot, you can never say Thomas said this because it, it's simply not, it doesn't meet any of the criteria that you would use as a historian to deem it as history. Oh, here um, we go again. One, All right. Kind of Stop. Context, right? Just uh, yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. You start it off while I get my uh, blood pressure under control here. You go right ahead, buddy. Yeah. Uh, to, to say he would know what a, a, a first century Jew, uh, he, he has no relation to Thomas. Uh, he has no document to support that assertion. Uh, what Thomas would be thinking. Obviously, John would, obviously, as an eyewitness of that time and around those historical figures, uh, is the perspective that we're getting uh, from John's testimony. And until he can produce a document establishing that, well, Thomas, as a, as a Jew, he would have never said that he was God. Uh, well, well, how do you know that? Um, what is your basis or foundation for making that assertion? Because I think what we keep hearing uh, from them is an assertion after an assertion after an assertion after another assertion. We hear terms like likely, there's no evidence, there's nothing that. So we're getting a consistent uh, strategy of here. Uh, just making a number of assertions. Uh, there's no basis in fact in any sort of documentation from the ancient world that would support that. Do they have a document that from Thomas that said, no, I, I didn't believe this? Uh, and, and I think that's what's happening here uh, is they're speculating from the 21st century uh, on this particular issue. And the earliest witness that can give us a perspective uh, from Thomas uh, is the apostles, John being himself. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and we can come back to this in a minute about other historians who make independent claims uh, from any of the histories that we have of Egypt to the time of the Greco-Roman world. But with that being said, again, this is an assumption. This is an assumption that John wasn't there. Um, there's a difference between a guy like Luke who wasn't there, who has to get his information from multiple people to affirm or things like that. John's not doing the work of history. He's not doing the work in that sense. He's doing a history, but he's not doing it from the perspective of, I need to study six different documents and find out which one really happened because I wasn't there. So I need help to do it. 
That's what Luke had to do. That's not what John had to do. John was had to be there. And not just that, as Jonathan and I were just pointing out a minute ago, John was not just the only one there. We see from the Muratorian fragment, we see from what you, what Clement of Alexandria was saying, John was working with other apostles that were still alive when he published this gospel. He was working with Andrew. So he didn't just work alone. This is a group golf. Folks, it's in the text. Like, read it carefully. It says, we know his testimony is true. We beheld his glory. Why is the writer saying we in the third person uh, plural? Because he's writing on behalf of a group. He's telling their story. So it's not just John's opinion. This is the opinion of the consensus of his own group that's publishing this gospel to begin with, which would include guys like Andrew and others. And could be Thomas was in that group with John. Remember, he's telling the story of the other apostles that didn't get uh, their stories necessarily told outside of their names listed in the synoptics. But again, he was there. He's not doing the work like a historian 200 years later who has to come up with how this took place and read the research of that time and then make a decision within that research. He was in the moment. He doesn't need to do it that way. They're treating the writer of John like Eusebius, who's trying to publish a history of the church by taking the church's earliest documents and corroborating them. That's, that's not what's needed by John. He's an eyewitness. Now, Jonathan, uh, how many historians in the ancient past make single claims that we can't find other documentation for? Do we just throw all those out too? How about guys like Josephus? How about people like Xenophon and statements that he makes, uh, you know, in his time as a philosopher? Like how many writers in the ancient world make single claims that we don't just toss? Yeah, we don't. And I, I think that's the fact when they bring up historical method, uh, we would have to throw out the statements of every ancient Greek and Roman historian uh, where their statements can't be corroborated. Uh, I mean... I mean, there's no narratives on uh, Josephus. I mean, he's writing as a person, but we don't have historical narratives from any ancient author uh, writing about the story of Josephus's life. And what we have here on Jesus is uh, four, four very specific historical narratives on uh, Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, so what we see here is over and above what we have for everybody else. Um, you know, a lot of what we rely on Cyrus the Great from is from uh, um, is from Xenophon. You know, there's an, there's so many statements that we can't corroborate uh, or find elsewhere, but is consistent uh, with the life and the character and the information he had. But but what we know about Cyrus or uh, about Xenophon is he was in a perfect position to get that information. And that's what we look at. We look at, yeah. uh, Arian thought the same thing with Ptolemy and Aristobulus, uh, two people that had been in the campaigns of Alexander the Great. And, and this is what we see here with John. These are one of the witnesses who had been with Jesus and the other apostles and can speak to this information. So we have a relevant uh, a knowledgeable witness that was familiar with the events, and they could speak to that. Uh, and I think what these commentators are leaving out is they have no ancient document to refute what's being said. Uh, they are just relying on conjecture. Uh, not even conjecture, it's just speculation uh, from someone in the 21st century that's trying to discredit the account and not bring forth any empirical documentation to support their claims. Yeah, and so that's that's the problem there too, Jonathan, and that's a good point. It's not only, yes, we want to cooperate as much as we can. It's great. But when the Gospels usually end up agreeing with each other, they get accused of copying each other anyway. So, I mean, <laughs> even when they do agree and cooperate, they're accused of copying and plagiarizing. Um rather than actually working together to tell the story. But when you have a guy like John, as Jonathan said, he was there. So that's a little bit different than somebody on the outside. But but also, again, keeping with all of these things, we have to remember on these accounts. In history, if you can't corroborate something, you don't automatically say it's false. That's not the next move. The next move is you come up with counter arguments to say that can't be true because in archaeology, we've discovered this 
whatever. And it has an inscription and it says it's, and then you deal with it that way. Or you say, it can't be because what we do know of that time, we have these historians that did publish uh, these works saying that this happened. And so that's actually contradictory to what this person says. We have four people over here saying this, one person saying this. We're going to go with the four people over here because the one person actually disagrees. With like, you can't just say, well, and you know, we don't, we, we can't say that's true because in the way of doing history, uh, an independent claim can't be history. Well, no, an independent claim cannot be excused in history just because it's independent either. You have to have a counter. Can you find a work in antiquity that discredits what John said? Can you find somebody that says, no, actually, that's not true. Jesus actually said it this way. And that person that's giving you the counter, does he have credibility? Was he alive in that time? Was he a, ear, a hearer of Jesus? You can't just say, well, he's by himself. Therefore, historically, we just can't accept it. No, you actually have to have a counterclaim to it. You can't just leave it like that. You actually have to go in and do the history to counterclaim it. And if you can't counterclaim it, you don't discredit it. You continue it as independent. But uh, I think we're running out on time. And I, I think we got 36 seconds total in to of uh, material. But there's <laughs> enough here to like, I think the main premise from what I remember is they keep repeating this kind of rhetoric throughout the rest of their three minutes anyway. So we would just be repeating ourselves. I feel like even now we're starting to repeat ourselves a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The basic element is who do you believe is behind it? If you don't believe it's an eyewitness, you got a lot of explaining to do again. And I encourage anybody, I did two entire videos on this, on John's gospel. The making of John's gospel is on the same exact YouTube channel. Please go check that out. I, I give a defense of John's gospel. It's eyewitness testimony. I did a second follow-up on it, how John is actually corresponding with Mark. I know a lot of people that like, they just said, well, John's by itself. It's not like the synoptics. Actually, if you study John very carefully, he's almost in this friendly competition with Peter's gospel in, in Mark. He actually finishes off Peter's sentences. He finishes off Peter's mishaps. He actually gives you the second half of the story of Peter's life. Um, actually, you will find John and Mark are very close in their following of each other and their narratives. And you can find that in my second video. So I encourage anybody, you know, if you're watching for the first time on this channel, make sure you like and subscribe uh, to Explore Christianity. We do stuff like this all the time, debates and discussions. We have our own personal videos. Uh, like, subscribe on the channel, and then also go down and look at some of the recent videos I did. I did two on John's gospel, and I give a fuller defense of its eyewitness testimony. So I, I would encourage anybody to consider this matter on a broad spectrum, not just what, well, a couple modern historians today say, well, look at a bigger picture than the last hundred years. I mean, let's look at the whole thing, right? Uh, so Santi, I mean, I guess we'll just leave it here with you to, to close out, but that would be my encouragement for anybody. Check out the other videos we've done, especially on John's gospel. But to me, it sounds like moving forward, these guys, if I remember, are just repeating some of the similar fallacies uh, as they go through. Yeah, and, and they also touch about, like, you know, what they believe the age of the book of John is and all that stuff, which is something that we touched on already. Um, and if anything, what we can do is just uh, do a follow-up video on some of the other material that they have done, not just this, because it, it is five videos um, probably close to six hours worth of uh, the stuff that we can do. And um, I really appreciate that you, um, Stephen and Jonathan, took the time here tonight to be with us uh, and all the people that were watching this. Uh, don't forget to like, uh, share, and subscribe. Uh, thank you for supporting this ministry. Um, and again, uh, I got a T-shirt right here. I don't know if you guys noticed it or not. I put it there on purpose. Uh, we have T-shirts. Uh, to represent they're pretty cool uh if you guys want one just let us know um and uh thank you all for being here tonight and we'll see you guys next time thank you jonathan and steven thanks for listening to the recovering fundamentalist podcast be sure to stop by our social media facebook instagram and twitter give us a follow also go to our website recoveringfundamentalist.org that's recoveringfundamentalist.org there you can find recovering fundamentalist swag you can get your t-shirts and hats you can join our x fundy community see where we're going to be having some meetups it's the recoveringfundamentalist.org be sure to join us next time for the recovering fundamentalist podcast